everyone, and welcome to the Venture Church online experience. We are thrilled that you joined us. Please worship the Lord with us. You 
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great Venture Church. We're in an Easter series this month called The End of Death. What we're doing is exploring five stories within the final seven days of Jesus' life. So far, we've explored the raising of Lazarus, the anointing in Bethany by Mary. Last week, we looked at the cursing of the fig tree. But today, we're going to explore an event called the Last Supper. Now, maybe everybody knows, but maybe not. So let me just ask anyway, what is a supper? Well, it might seem funny, but I I grew up in rural Iowa, and in the world that I grew up in, lunch was a snack. It was a snack that you ate in between your meals or after. Dinner, on the other hand, was the meal that you ate at noon. But the final meal of the day, the the grand finale, was called the supper. So for us, it was breakfast, dinner, and supper with lunch in between. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's carry on. But more important than what you call it is actually what happened there. What happened at the Last Supper was epic. I mean, so many big things happened within that meal. Things like the bread and the wine were explained to us. The the betrayal of Judas was exposed. The denial of Peter was revealed. But perhaps most importantly of all, or most shockingly of all, true greatness 
was defined. See, at the Last Supper, during the meal, the disciples were actually arguing over which of them would be considered the greatest. I mean, shocking? Yeah, sort of, but not really. Especially when you consider it's why Jesus had to come and die for us. The, 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 the extent of our sin, it was shocking. See, I am by sinful nature selfish. I, I'm prone to think about myself most of the time, if not all the time. And in case you forgot, so do you. <laughs> Our story today has something profound to say about greatness, true greatness. You see, being great is not found in being served, but rather in serving, just like Jesus. We're going to read Luke's account today, and a little bit of John, but mostly Luke. So if you're ready, grab your Bible or follow along on your screen, and let's read this amazing story called The Last Supper, beginning in verse 7. And then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. Say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you to a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Let's pause there. What, what a rich story. Let me highlight a, a few things to you from the story. N number one, Luke is describing to us the Jewish festival called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, it was a seven-day celebration in which the Jews ate bread without yeast, unleavened bread. But also on the first day of this feast, the, the Jews celebrated the Passover. It, it was the highlight of the year. It, it was a celebration designed to help the Israelites remember how God had saved them from Egyptian bondage. But the second thing I want you to see is, is the fact that Jesus sends Peter and John on this preparation journey for the Passover. Now, that, it would be easy to gloss over that and not think anything about it. But, but think for just a moment. Now, certainly there were a number of preparations that had to be made. There was food to be bought and, and the room had to be ready. But, but there was one particular preparation that would have been challenging. It was the cleaning. I mean, the place had to be scoured and cleaned from top to bottom. Now, not just any kind of cleaning. It was a kind of on-your-face-with-your-toothbrush kind of cleaning, the kind of cleaning that would look between the cracks and the crevices, not for dirt, but for leaven, little pieces of leaven. There, there couldn't be a single spot of leaven anywhere. And Peter and John were asked to go and prepare the room for that amazing Passover festival. Now, I'm speculating, but I can't help but think, Peter and John, they're clearly known as like Jesus' top dogs. They're the inner circle. If Jesus goes somewhere important, if he's up to something big, they're right there with him always. And now here they are, being asked to do something that would be real easy to feel like is beneath my status. I mean, the other disciples could have done it. They were all capable, except for maybe Judas. You wouldn't have sent him. But, but Andrew, he was a master problem solver. He was great at thinking outside the box. He could have gone. Any one of them could have done it. But it makes me wonder, if, if Jesus didn't send Peter and John, his two top men, on this mission, maybe with the purpose 
actually to kind of ruffle their pride feathers. But let, let me highlight a third thing before we move on in our story. And the third thing I'd like to draw your attention to are the details of the story. See, when Peter and John asked for some directions, where's the house going to be? How are we going to find it? Jesus says, well, just look for the man carrying a water jar. Okay, you say, but wait, hold on, time out. 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel, guess who carried the water jars? The women. Men carried water in pouches, leather pouches on their side. It was typically the Jewish women who would have carried the jars of water. A man carrying a water jar would stick out like a sore thumb. And, and notice when, when Peter and John arrived in this upper room, what did they find? They, find? they found everything perfect. It was the perfect size. It was even already completely furnished. Now, th that draws us to this amazing conclusion. We must never forget that God is never asleep at the wheel. He's always way ahead of us. Every detail, no matter how small, how insignificant, or how complex, our God has the details under control. Let's read on. Verse 14. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. First of all, let me say to you, don't miss Jesus' attitude. He's eager. It says he told the disciples that he was eager to eat this Passover with them. Now that's shocking because I can think of many attitudes or emotions to feel, but just hours away from the cross... Eager would not be one of them. Jesus is eager. Well, e eager is a word that speaks of kind of a looking forward to, a, a kind of anticipation and excitement. Well, what does that speak to? Well, it speaks to the very heart of God. You see, Jesus isn't eager to suffer, but he is eager to resolve the sin problem that's brought him to this place. He's eager to resolve what has, has kept us in the dark for so long, the problem of our sin, our sin that has separated us from God. It, it makes you realize that, that all along, it's, it's all that God has really ever been after from us, a, a relationship. Remember when, when God came looking for Adam in the garden? What was he looking for? He was looking for his friend, the one whom he walked and talked in the garden with. Remember what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20? He, he said, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And if you would open the door of your heart, I would come in. And guess what we would do? We would eat together. We would eat together. We would fellowship together. We would enjoy this intimacy, this friendship together. See, all along, it's what Jesus has been after. His mission and his purpose is to restore relationship with us and God. But one second thing before we move on. Jesus says twice, he says, he says this, I will not be eating or drinking any more of this Passover meal until the f it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now, what do you suppose that's about? Jesus sort of abruptly ends the meal, and he says, I won't be drinking anymore or eating anymore until I'm in the kingdom of God with you. It, it, hours earlier, Jesus had told a parable, a, a parable about a, another supper that was coming. Did you know there's another supper? 
There's a supper in the future, probably not too far from now. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus told a parable about it with the ten virgins. In the book of Revelation, we, we hear about it. But it, we discover that, that the midnight cry goes out and, and, the, and the, the virgins who were ready hear the call, here's the bridegroom, come rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And in, in the book of Revelation, we hear these words, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, Jesus tells his disciples powerful reminders that he's coming again. And when he comes again, we're going to be invited together to sit down at the banquet, the great feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then Jesus will pick up the cup and he will finish, completely finish what he started at the Passover meal. But let's, let's continue our story. Verse 19, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who was going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Jesus took the bread and the wine. The bread he broke, the wine he poured out, reminding us that Jesus, our Passover lamb, was about to accomplish for us the purpose of the Passover. Jesus was going to give his life. He was going to shed his blood. His, his life was broken and his blood was poured out for our redemption. Jesus told us to do it, to do this in remembrance of this amazing sacrifice that he's made on our behalf. But then Jesus reveals the identity, the reality of the betrayer. He's sitting right here among us. His, his hand is on the table with us. See, just hours earlier, Jesus had declared seven woes upon the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And now Jesus uses this word woe as a declaration of divine judgment against this one who would betray Jesus. It, it's shocking to me that in, in the last sentence of our, of our paragraph that the disciples, they don't even have a clue who the betrayer might be. See, I think there's a reason for that. Let's continue our story in verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. See, what Jesus is talking about is epic. It's incredibly important regarding their future and regarding the kingdom of God, issues of incredible importance. But while Jesus is discussing this thing, these important things, the disciples are having another discussion among themselves. They're arguing over which of them will be the greatest in this coming kingdom. You, you've got to ask, how is that even possible? Well, it's very possible. In fact, it, it points to the, to the whole problem, the whole problem of, of why Jesus had to die. The, the radical problem of sin that consumed me and makes me 
so all about myself required such a radical solution as the cross. Now there are many reactions. You, you can imagine what must have been going through Jesus' mind at that very moment. He's telling them of his death. He's talking of his, of his, of his death. And all they can talk about is themselves. I mean, couldn't you see Jesus throwing his hands up in the air and saying, I'm done with the lot of you. I'm out of here. But he does something so incredibly different at that moment. To tell you what he did, I, I have to take you to another place in Scripture. Just for a moment. We're not going to read the whole passage. It's too long. And we don't need to. But at that moment, in John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, if I'll put that reference on the screen and you can look it up. Write it down and look it up yourself. But you see, at that very moment, while the disciples are being so incredibly selfish, Jesus picks up a towel and a basin of water. And, and while it's all happening, Jesus stands up and he takes off his outer clothing and he wraps this towel around his waist and he pours water into a basin and he begins washing the disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Can you imagine? In, in the midst of all of this, instead of being angry, Jesus humbles himself, he lowers himself, and washes their feet. When he comes to Peter, Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Well, Jesus says, yes. Peter says, no, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash your feet... You have no part with me. Well, they have a, quite the discussion about that, but in the conclusion of it all, Jesus tells the disciples very clearly, he says, now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, now wash one another's. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Greatness is about serving and not being served. If, if you're going to be my disciple, Jesus said, you're going to serve like I served. And of course, at this moment, Jesus reveals a shocking revelation to Peter. In verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. It's not surprising. Satan wanted to sift all of the disciples like chaff from the wheat. But it's wonderful to realize that he can't do that. He can't do anything without the Lord allowing it to happen. But notice what saves the day? Jesus' prayer. Jesus has prayed for Simon. I, I wish I could explain to you how that works, but I don't know. I don't understand it all, but I'm certainly grateful for it. To know that we have a Savior, a high priest in the heavens, who prays for us. And his prayers are powerful. His prayers are transforming. His prayers make the difference. And then, of course, Jesus tells Peter. He tells him, oh, and by the way, when you have turned back from your failure, I want you to strengthen your brothers. I, I love that, that, that Jesus essentially tells Peter, even before he knows it's going to happen himself, Jesus tells him about it. Think of, the, think of the vast numbers of people in human history that have been helped, that have found encouragement from Peter's story. Just think of it. How many people have been on the brink of their own disaster and it was Peter's failure that made the difference? It's just like God to do that, isn't it? Just like God to take our brokenness, our weaknesses, and, and use them for his glory. 
But poor Peter, he's still clueless. He, he still says he's ready to go die with Jesus. But truth be told, before the rooster crows, he'll deny Jesus three times. Well, that's our story for today. We could go on. There's more, and I wish we could, but I'd like to bring us home with a few lessons from our story. Four lessons. Four lessons that are deeply meaningful in my life, and I pray they will be in yours as well. Lesson number one. You can trust Jesus in all the details of your life. All of them. I use the word details because I wanted you to remember what Jesus did for Peter and John. Remember the, remember the little detail of the man carrying the, 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 the jar of water? Remember the, remember the Passover room, the upper room that was fully furnished and all prepared for their coming? My hunch is the floors had even been swept and cleaned. My hunch is they didn't even have to do it. Someone had already taken care of the details. And that someone was Jesus. You know, he's been that way for me. And, I'm, and I know whether you've been aware of it or not, he's done the same for you. Working sometimes behind the scenes. Sometimes rather right in front of my face. But always working in the details of my life. Bringing us to where he wants us to be. What a wonderful Savior. We stand amazed at his power and glory, his working in the details of our lives. Lesson number two, never forget the sacrificial price tag of forgiveness. It was a, it was a price tag in blood. The broken body and the poured out blood of Jesus, that was the price of forgiveness. Sometimes I think, I think about the death that Jesus endured. I, I think about the beatings, the, the, the Roman whip that with its pieces of stone and glass woven into it that would have ripped his flesh. I think about the crown, the crown of thorns that they pushed upon his head. Then I imagine the, the the feet and the hands being nailed to a cross. And then in my mind's eye, I imagine Jesus on the cross, the, the cruel, horrific death that he died, the sacrificial price, and it was all for my sin, my sin. It, it, it forces me, it causes me to, 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 to sing his praises. It, it drives me to, to pursue a sinlessness, to, to, to do the very best, to avoid sin at all cost in my life when I realize the price that Jesus paid. Lesson number three. God is able to use my failures to strengthen others. It's what he did in Peter's life. Peter would, would commit the unthinkable he would literally deny that he even knew Jesus. He would curse him. He would curse him and deny that he knew him. Imagine. Imagine the shame. Imagine the pain of that moment. But, but imagine how God has used that story, a story through the centuries that have encouraged the broken among us who have had our own seasons of rejection, our own seasons of, of turning and walking away or fearful or angry with God or whatever your story might be. God has used Peter's failures to strengthen others and he'll use your story and mine to help people as well. It brings us to lesson number four. We serve because we belong to Jesus. You see, at the end of the day, that's our motivation. Jesus has set for us an example. He has taken the, the basin of water and the towel, and he humbled himself, and he washed the disciples' feet. See, we serve not because we're something. We serve because he's something, 
and we belong to him. Let me, let me tell you a little story. It's a wonderful one. I've, it's kind of been, it's been in my uh, resource, my little storybook for many, many years, and I don't think I've told it to you for a long time. It's a story of a man named Samuel Bringle. It was May of 1887. He was 27 years old. Samuel Bringle felt God's call in his life to leave the state of New York and travel all the way to London, England to join General William Booth's Salvation Army. When he arrived, he was, he was looked at with incredible suspicion. General William Booth told him, he said, you know, you've been your own boss too long. We are an army and we demand obedience. You see, they tended to view Samuel Bringle as what they called a dangerous class. He was educated, a little too educated, a little too high and mighty, a little too arrogant for the likes of the Salvation Army. They viewed him as not reliant upon the power of the Holy Spirit. So the very first duty that the chief of staff with the Salvation Army assigned Samuel Bringle was in the cellar. That's right. He was handed a boot brush, water, and polish. And he was told to go into the basement and polish the boots of his fellow cadets. In his disappointment, I mean, he prayed to the Lord there in that basement. He prayed, prayed to the Lord to take away this menial task, this abuse. He considered a waste of his time, a waste of his, of his life. But in the answer to his prayer, Samuel Bringle saw Christ. He saw Jesus bending over the feet of his 12 disciples, including Simon Peter and Judas Iscariot. And it was then that Samuel Logan Bringle whispered this prayer. He said, Lord, thou didst wash their feet. I will black their boots. He then went to the work joyfully, back to work, cleaning the boots with a brand new song in his heart. See, what Bringle thought was menial all at once became meaningful. It became his journey toward becoming a servant leader, a leader in the Salvation Army. What has Jesus placed in your hand to help you become the servant that you need to be? Where has he put you? What opportunities has he put before you? He's a wonderful Savior. He came all the way from heaven to earth, humbled himself even to the point of obedience on a cross. And now he calls us. He calls us to be his servants, to serve his people, to serve this broken world. I know that's the desire of your heart. I, I, I love what Albert Schweitzer, the famous missionary to Africa, had to say. He said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who will have sought and found how to serve. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we worship you on this very special day. We recognize the sacrifice that you made. We honor you. We love you. We open the door of our heart and we invite Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. We humble ourselves before you. We offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. We pray that you would open our eyes and open doors for us that we might be your servants. Father, we worship you. And we love you and we pray your richest blessing on all of your people. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing you back here next Sunday for Easter Sunday and the conclusion of our series. Well, the Lord bless you and we love you all.